Yeah. What do they call it these days? It's like a, a digital a digital show. <laughs> Is there a name for this? Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer Podemski. I am from Muscapeding First Nation, Soto, born and raised in Toronto, living in Barrie. My name is Shoshona Kish, and I am Eagle Clan, and my family comes from a place called Batchawana. Once in a while, we get a chance to sit down, and we realize that we have so much to talk about, and so many things mm -hmm. that might be relevant and important to other people. So, yeah, and I think we wanted to share some of the ideas that uh, that we're talking about and that are you know coming from our travels and the amazing brilliant people that we are talking to out in the world and in our community and i find that stuff really inspires me and makes my life better and we wanted to share it with you well you travel the world like on a regular on the regular on the regular you travel, travel the world yeah um so when we get together i'm always just so eager to learn of you know things that you've discovered along your journeys and uh, I don't travel as much as you do. Yeah, I well still, the world kind of comes to you too. I feel, I feel like I'm <laughs> learning all the time. Yeah. And I'm yeah. also learning to as a storyteller kind of I guess going out into the communities with my series Future History. I feel like I've learned more in the last year than in the past, I don't know, 20. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that's kind of this time in our lives, you know, like in our 40s. Yeah. And uh, I, my brain is working differently and I'm moving through the world differently and the kind of conversations I'm having and the way I'm interpreting all of that is different yeah, now. I don't know, maybe that's called maturity. Maybe not. <laughs> no, you know what, I think you're right. I think that th for me, there are two parts. One, I have a six and an eight year old who mm -hmm. are constantly teaching me um, things about myself and things about the world, new perspectives, you know, these are two people, two human beings that I listen to. The other part for sure is, you know, being in my 40s, <laughs> <laughs> seeing things in a different, in a different way, mm -hmm. coming to terms with a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's been a, it's been a time of transformation for me. And maybe it does have to do with my age, and maybe it has to do with, I don't know, the world or my children, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But that being said, that's why we thought this was a good time to come together and uh, start to share that mm -hmm. conversation. Yeah, I think that maybe there's an accelerated thing happening in the world right now that we're responding to, you know, and um, certainly the level of conversation and discourse around things that matter to me is changing, and... Uh, I can be in place, the most unlikely places in, you know, sort of my preconception, you know, middle America and hear the most revolutionary, uh, hopeful conversations that mm -hmm. really inspire me. And so I think, uh, yeah, I think that there is something happening out there mm -hmm. that, you know, is also shifting and moving in me. Mm -hmm. That is a good point. And mm -hmm. you're someone who constantly reminds me about our our own individual power to look for inspiration and to be inspired. And I think that is a good segue to, for this question, what ha recently for you, what has been something that's inspired you? Like something, you know, that made you think differently. If I'm paying attention, there are these like really bright moments of light and inspiration um, on a regular basis and sometimes we get so busy with you know our own lives that we miss them so I've been really trying to pay attention I was recently in Arkansas uh, visiting this really amazing beautiful little town called Bentonville with all of this really inspiring stuff going on there and I had a conversation with a dear friend of mine um, who I believe is a world changer and a revolutionary in, in his own way and he was talking to me about this uh, event that he's organizing called The Great Listening. And he was inspired to start this event um, from a dear friend of ours who's uh, an indigenous leader in the States by the name of Gerald Torres. This idea of The Great Listening for me was um, 
it was just like sparks going off in my mind, you know. I, and it's such a simple thing and really so deeply cultural for us as Indigenous people, this idea of making space, being quiet, and just uh, having big ears and listening. And just this real reminder of those roots for me and being somebody who's a performer and being asked to speak a lot, this idea of just reflecting on listening and the importance of that um, and really sort of feeling it in an emotional way because mm -hmm. the context of the conversation with, with my friend Troy was imagine what's possible if we all just listen to each other. And I thought, yeah, that's something I need to return to in a really decisive way and make more space for in my life. Mm -hmm. I, I have a tendency to get caught up in the, the bad things. Not get caught up, but I feel the pull towards anger. I feel like I know that, I know that sensation when I'm being pulled towards anger. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to feel that way because I know that it's not productive. And sometimes I look at the world and our situation in our communities and in our own families and I feel helpless. Mm -hmm. I also have an ability to see beauty in things that maybe other people might not. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's almost like a superpower <laughs> because, yeah. you know, when I really sit with the things that seem really small and insignificant and allow them to inspire me, my day changes and then mm -hmm. my attitude changes and the way I treat people changes. And I believe that that has sort of a, uh, you know, a ripple effect. Well, and it's contagious. Yeah. And I, like, I do believe that, mm -hmm. that, that, so it's really your perception of something, you know, shifts the way you respond and behave mm -hmm. and, you know, shift things for the better mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the things around you and the people, you know, it's exponential. Mm -hmm. I think there were a couple of things over the last week uh, that helped me change my mind about the ugliness in the world. Mm. And I guess I'll focus on yesterday because yesterday was actually Indigenous People's Day. I say it like that because, <laughs> I don't know, it's kind of like that every day for, for <laughs> us. Yeah. And uh, I went to my kid's school and I was, I, I had invited um, one of our friends, Dr. Deb Daynard, and she brought some water teachings to the kids and we all sat outside. And I always get really, really nervous when I go and talk to kids mm -hmm. because they're a really hard audience. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not amazing listeners all the time. And, you know, it's, it's hard. I have hard enough time with two kids. Anyways, we were sitting there um, and I had asked the kids, these were grade one and grade two, and I brought my hand drum and I had been given a song from my sister that I brought to the kids in October, taught it to them, and asked them yesterday if they remembered the song. And this is an mm -hmm. entirely Ojibwe song. And they all got really excited and said yes. And you know, my two kids being the only Anishinaabe kids in the school, or indigenous kids, I think, mm. in the whole school, I think felt really, really proud mm. of, you know, being connected to where that song comes from. Mm -hmm. So when I was singing it and the, the 50 kids, you know, non-Indigenous kids singing in this, in Ojibwe and, you know, passing my drum around for them to sing and drum these Ojibwe words that my sister wrote, that whole experience, for me to say it's life-changing sounds like I might be exaggerating, but I, I think it, I think it was life-changing. Mm. And I really want to endeavor to have those experiences every day because mm -hmm. it's so easy to get sucked into mm -hmm. the negativity. Just that idea of paying enough attention that these life-changing moments actually can find their potential instead of just sort of breezing through the day with the cynicism that I think we all, you know, have really um, taken on from the battery of, you know, that negativity in mainstream culture right now mm -hmm. and that cynicism, which I think is really powerful thing and and I, I believe that the cynicism isn't a, maybe it's purposeful in some way but I think it's a way of creating distance and protecting ourselves you know because it's so dangerous to believe and it's so dangerous to put yourself out there as um, this vulnerable sort of being just trying to learn and and make 
life better. You know, that um, the potential of that failing, I think, causes us to kind of act like it doesn't matter, you know? So then kindness is an act of resistance. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. And gratitude yeah. is a profound act of resistance. <sighs> cool. <laughs> All right, on that note, uh, so we have this lovely little bowl here. This, this bowl was made by George Leach in 2009. If you don't know George Leach, he's an amazing singer, songwriter, yeah. artist. He's actor. Actor. He's mm -hmm. like crazy talented and someone it's beautiful. we love. So he, he made this and it's been on display in my house for, well, since 2009. And we're going to be picking from this little pot every episode and discussing the topic that's on this this piece of paper and maybe eventually <laughs> you'll help us come up with topics yeah okay so it's very scientific here we go. oh okay feminism all right should I do that again <laughs> <laughs> so we can talk about feminism okay feminism what it means to me this is a hard one it is me. a hard one yeah it's it is a hard one. And, but the thing is that I, I want to have discussions that are hard for us. Yeah. I think that we have sort of our fluid things that we're talking about all the time. And then there are other topics maybe that um, we're discussing less. Um, and, and I also think that part of why we wanted to have these conversations was to talk about things that um, addressed our feminine relationship to ourselves and each other in yes. the world and like you know talk about things relating to women um partly just because that's you know our center mm -hmm. in some profound way but also because i think there's a range of topics that women aren't discussing mm -hmm. that you know feminism not being one of them necessarily yeah, yeah. we're talking about it again so this is good okay so on the topic of feminism, well, I guess the first, it's on here, the first question, the first thing to discuss is what, what it means to me. Mm. So let's, let's answer. Yes, what that. does it mean to you? I really struggle with that word. Mm. I could, because I don't know what feminism means to me. I, mm. I guess the younger version of myself imagined that I was or thought that I was a feminist because I was fiercely independent when it came to my income, mm -hmm. when it came to my work life, uh, my decision making, when I, when I thought about, you know, my role in society as a woman, I felt very empowered mm -hmm. because of my financial independence. Hmm. As I got older, I realized that my sense hmm. of empowerment and defining myself as independent financially and feeling, you know, very proud of that was mm -hmm. it actually exists within the the definition of patriarchy. Well, yeah. Right? Like Yeah. <clears throat> so I had to step back and look at how I was defining myself as a woman. Mm -hmm. And I was using a definition or a structure that essentially was, you know, created by men or is typically referred to as a, a male yeah. position mm -hmm. in life. So well, I don't a, want to a define... colonial a, position yes. too, well, exactly. which is, you know, has that whole value set. Well, built that's, into it. Yes, that's yeah. a very that's a very good point, and that's really what it was. Like the the current structure, mm -hmm. you know, that we live in, this is a colonial structure. And mm -hmm. I think when I started to really reconnect with myself as a woman and un unlearn those, you know, mm -hmm. very rigid rules and mm -hmm. um, definitions about um, what it was to be a feminist, I I realized that I actually don't really know even what that word means mm -hmm. and I had to kind of start from the beginning mm -hmm. so that's I guess that's the first thing that comes to my mind mm -hmm. I had to um yeah, we were talking about how the boxes that we 
find ourselves in, whether we put ourselves there uh, because that's what we've been taught to do or whether we're put in them. And learning how to unpack those spaces, right. you know. And for me, feminism came with all of the, the baggage, really, that um, it, did, it does for most people because there was such an effective propaganda campaign set out, I think, in the 70s. I haven't done, like research on when it exactly began but to disempower the movement and that you know feminism was about being angry feminism was about uh burning bras i mean this is archaic at this point in our <laughs> culture but that stuff carried forward and it was sort of a bad word and even five years ago i did a, a university um, graduate student interviewed me about feminism and these were still like really relevant things for this 22 year old trying to deconstruct, you know, feminism as being a bad word mm -hmm. and find their own relationship to it, um, both in their academic career, but also personally. And so it was really interesting for me to have this discussion with this young woman and all of those biases remaining still so strong, you know, and I think that in the last five years, we've really seen a reclaiming of the word feminism and a new uh, relationship and meaning to it for, for us as women, um, definitely in the West, but I, I see evidence of it, you know, globally. But I also had the, the, another layer of things where I grew up around really strong indigenous women who were like, we're not feminists, we're indigenous women. This isn't a movement, this is our identity. You know, we come from matriarchal societies and this, there are things that fall outside of the definition of the way people think of feminism and how, what that movement is fighting for that actually aren't what we want in our communities in the rebalancing and aren't, don't speak for who we are. So I, you know, I really contemplated that heavily in my, as a young woman coming into my own identity um, and exploring what that was, uh, I also rejected the word feminism on that basis. Language is really powerful and I think that the word feminism has been co-opted and has been um, embraced and defined by many communities in different ways and I relate to the word because you know I relate to the idea that beyond my own identity and my own definition of freedom and equality, there are other women making those definitions for themselves mm -hmm. also. And the fluidity of that word and the power that, uh, that that fluidity holds for us as women, I'm invested in the potential of that unifying idea. That we get to define, we get to decide for ourselves, and we can stand together in those differences and, and commonalities with you know, power, and, and I'm, that's what I want. You know, I want, I want to be able to stand in a powerful, beautiful place with mm -hmm. women and not necessarily agree on or even define the movement, you know? I just, yeah, I, I just changed all of, my, all of my thoughts and perspectives and I'll become what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds really awesome. I want to be a part of that movement. Well, and you know, I think that this is part of what doesn't allow us to stand together is we want to define things and we yeah. want to control them and we want to decide who gets to wear the, the logo or, or is the kind of feminist that we align ourselves with or, and I just think all of that stuff is bullshit. Yeah. You know, really the idea is we have so much to, to learn from each other and we're not the trying to take a position um, on what someone else defines in their own identity as feminism is a complete waste of time. Mm -hmm. I think one, one of the things that I have come to realize about my, my, maybe not my view on feminism, but my view on myself as a woman mm. is my ability to nurture. And I'm not saying that that's across the board, every woman has <laughs> that uh, innate, innate ability. Mm -hmm. But I feel like I, I have this sense inside of me that I, my, my best attribute 
is as a nurturer mm. of people, of things, of thoughts, of ideas. Um, and to have, as you said, autonomy mm -hmm. of, and be able to choose what you nurture. Mm -hmm. And also not, not feel weak mm -hmm. because you want to nurture things and people. Right. I want yeah. to be empowered and feel strong and be and become stronger because of my ability to nurture. I feel like that's a part of my place in yes. you know, in the room, in a group, in the community, in society. I don't expect that every woman should feel that, but I think we should we we each should have our own sense of you know where where we belong or how to stand in our strength mm -hmm. without being criticized especially by each other mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and as like you said to to take away those definitions in in moving forward on these you know the idea of feminism or breaking down the the word or the concept moving into the future what is your dream or vision of of where that where the movement where is the going movement or what it what it is I think of the movement as being much bigger than feminism you know I think where we're going as women as we step forward and what we're dreaming for our daughters and our granddaughters or if we you know can hold that space genuinely for seven generations ahead and what we dream for the women in seven generations from now I think that they will still be having these conversations about balance and I hope that it can change from a discussion of um, equality to a discussion of balance. Uh, I think the word equality is useful right now, I think it's really important, um, but I, I think that it causes us to think about wanting the same things that men have, mm -hmm. which leads to us rejecting our you know, uh, nurturing um, gifts if we have them or leads us to making too much importance in like how much we earn mm -hmm. as being, not that we shouldn't want to earn things or have abundance, but that that's connected to our value mm -hmm. and our power mm -hmm. of being a woman um, or the effectiveness of our, you know, fight in the feminist struggle or something, you know, like mm -hmm. this will this makes us bona fide feminists if we have achieved these certain things and, and we're measuring it all by what men have traditionally had. And I think that what I dream for us is to, to be able to measure what that balance means truly for us, not in a reactive way, but it, like just standing in our center, in our power as women and being connected, you know, to the power of creation mm -hmm. um, and holding that in in a way that it's my hope that our great 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 granddaughters will hold that in a way that doesn't question it mm -hmm. and isn't trying to reconnect that they're just standing there mm -hmm. you know yeah i love that yeah so on that note we'll put it out to you share with us your thoughts on the the word feminism or the word feminist and the movement or anything you've seen in this un-TV show, <laughs> this episode of this un-TV show. Please like, share, and subscribe to this video and this channel. And yeah, let's stay connected. Yeah, we'll come, we'll come up with more and continue this. Bye.